We have a, a general cultural abhorrence of fat today, uh, which is a, a very recent trend. You know, my mother, I think, exemplifies this. My mother, I grew up sort of being afraid of fat. My mother made us remove the egg yolks from every egg, and we, we never got ice cream, we had frozen yogurt. And yet, as an evolutionary biologist, I've come to appreciate that without fat, we'd be, we'd be dead. Without fat, humans wouldn't be the way we are. Fat is really life. We associate leanness with health, and of course, leanness is a totally different thing. Clearly, there's huge sociological players in how relative degrees of obesity or leanness are perceived. It's obviously not something that's inbuilt into Homo sapiens, because there are places in the world where it's different, and there are ages and times when it's been different. When Rubens was painting, the optimal female beauty was much larger than the optimal female beauty in 20th century Europe. Fat isn't just there to be unpleasant and cosmetically disturbing, it's there for a function. When I think of mammals, the word that comes to mind is adaptation. Mammals originally took foot on the planet Earth by going into these little evolutionary crevice niches, caves, cool places, wet places, dark places. We can go a quite a long time without food, much longer than, than some other animals can. Fat really gave us a big advantage um, in terms of beginning to colonize hostile environments. Life is about using energy to make more life. That's about as good a definition of life as I can come up with. We eat food because it has energy in the form of chemical bonds, which we then either burn immediately or we store. So there's this constant fluctuation of energy going in and out. When you're eating a meal, you're in what we call positive energy balance because you're bringing in energy. And when you sleep, you're in negative energy balance because you're now burning that just to maintain your body. So our bodies have all kinds of tricks to make sure that we never run out of energy. And the main way in which we store energy is fat. Fat tissue is quite complex, but its primary purpose is to have these resident cells called adipocytes or fat cells. And their primary purpose is to be the place where you store this vast larder of, 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 of lard. The fat cell has often been described in the past as, a, as like a fried egg on a beach ball. So, so the beach ball is, is the droplet of fat and the fried egg is the little nucleus with a tiny rim of cytoplasm going all the way around the beach ball that the only cell in the body that can occupy themselves with 99% of their volume with a single droplet of triglyceride. Triglyceride is a chemical substance, but it's a naturally occurring chemical substance, and it's the way in which we store fat, and it, it is, in chemical terms, a fat. Fat is composed of you know, a glycerol with three fatty acid chains that come off of it, and those fatty acid chains, our bodies are beautifully able to cleave them, you know, bit by bit, and we, we burn them. And so a, a little bit of fat produces vast amounts of energy. I mean, fat does burn. If you take a piece of fat that you cut off a lamb chop and you put a match to it and you light it, fat burns. Whale oil was used uh, as, a, as a source of light and heat. That's just melted fat from the whale. There are chunks of a fat molecule that are identical to chunks of a gasoline molecule. They're just long carbon chains that are full of high energy electrons. Now, if you, if you simply liberated the fat in your body by literally burning it, obviously it would generate a lot of heat, which would damage your body. So really what your body has learned to do is extract the energy slowly so that it doesn't cause destruction. We take off two carbons at a time, two carbons at a time, and we throw those carbons into what's called the Krebs cycle. By running it through a series of chemical reactions, it allows the energy to come out in small bursts in a way that can be captured. 
but from a physical chemistry point of view, it's really very similar to burning. In the, you start with a hunk of fat, you end up with carbon dioxide and water, and the energy has been released. The understanding that fat was a place where you put excess calories and the understanding of the biochemistry of that has been long standing, uh, but it thought to be a bit boring. I mean, it's, it's a kind of like the backstore larder and you just put it away and it wasn't a very, you know, the fat cell wasn't a very intelligent cell. It wasn't doing anything terribly clever. It was just storing away uh, stuff for a rainy day. Uh, 1994, 1995 were, were good years in this field. In 1994, we found PPAR gamma, the master gene of fat. You can put this, put this DNA binding factor into, into many cells and pow, two days later you have a fat cell. So it then became accessible. What is going on? How does fat form? And then that same year, Jeff Friedman published the cloning and identification of leptin, the hormone that fat cells make that talk to the brain. They were published in the same year. This was something that people wanted to work on. So the leptin comes from your fat tissue, it goes through the blood, it latches onto highly selective and specific receptors in the brain, and those turn on a whole pattern of activity within the brain. In one fell swoop, you know, this adipocyte, the fat cell, went from being a, a dumb, one of the most boring cells in the world, into being an intelligent member of the neuroendocrine signaling community. You know, fat is an organ. It's, it's doing stuff. It's talking to muscle. It's talking to liver. It's talking to the brain and letting all the other tissues know what is the status of energy stores in the body. Should we signal to slow down the appetite? Should we increase appetite? What leptin does is if you go below a certain amount of stored fat, the drop in leptin suddenly sets a whole clanging alarm signal in the brain. You turn off reproduction, you turn off sexual drive, you turn on appetitive drive, a whole range of hormonal changes to, to, to signal that you are actually going to starve to death. If women become too thin, whether by anorexia nervosa or by overtraining athletically, they stop ovulating. That is a function of adipose tissue. More and more we are discovering that tissues talk to each other um, and, and coordinate each other's function. So it isn't just the brain, it isn't just the fat, it isn't just the muscle. The fat talks to the brain, the brain by eating affects the hormone levels. And so the whole thing is a really complex interwoven network that allows the body to do these functions without things going very much out of control. Fat is important to all animals, but humans are especially adapted to be fat. Even thin humans who have very little fat on them, by our perspective, are extremely fat compared to most primates. Nothing makes sense except through the prism of evolution. I mean, so therefore, one always tends to go back to evolution and work out why things happened. The average primate out there is probably five to eight percent body fat. Uh, the average thin human hunter-gatherer is a female would be 15 to 25 percent body fat, and males might be 10 to 15 percent body fat. That's not accidental. Everybody knows humans have big brains. Our brains are, for example, about four times the size of a chimpanzee's brain. Brains are very expensive. Your brain, just even when you're asleep, your brain requires an enormous amount of energy to function. You spend about 20 to 25 percent of your resting metabolism to pay for your brain. All the cells require, you know, you have to constantly regenerate the neurotransmitters, the cost of transmitting electrical potentials down each cell and, you know, each axon in the brain costs a lot of energy. Which means that if you're in a state of negative energy balance, if you're not taking in as much energy as you're, um, as you're expending, you're going to have to essentially provide that energy from storage. And of course that comes from fat. And if you don't supply your brain with that energy, you're, you go into, well, you die. If blood sugar drops even once, you would rapidly have a deterioration in your cognitive function. You would be equivalent to someone who's just drunk a half a bottle of whiskey. Evolutionally, you can imagine, even one episode like that, you'd be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. You know, it takes about three years for a chimpanzee's brain to grow, and then another three years before that chimpanzee can more or less feed itself independently. We spend about six years growing our brains, and then another 12 years in maturing the body. Mothers wean their infants at a very young age while their brains are still growing, while that 
child is still incredibly unable to take care of itself. Having that long period of development means we can spend a lot longer adapting that brain to the world around it. You know, learning languages or you know, learning skills, getting, getting good at complex tasks. We've invented a period of, of development called childhood that no other organism has. From the perspective of the mother, they have to take care of their infants, they have to take care of their nine-year-olds, right? That takes energy. And a mother can't do that without uh, having not only lots of energy supplied to her on a daily basis, but also she needs to have energy reserves. Because you can imagine, if there ever was a case when you know, energy was limited, mothers who had more fat would have been much more strongly selected for, because they wouldn't have lost their offspring. And so we mustn't confuse fat, which is essentially a generally healthy and important and necessary nutrient with, with diseases that come from too much fat. As far as I know, there's no evidence for any examples of type 2 diabetes among hunter-gatherers. It's extremely rare among subsistence farmers, and yet it's now one of the most rapidly growing diseases in the world. We're in the midst of a worldwide epidemic, in, not just in, in, in the Western industrial world. A lot of people don't realize that type 2 diabetes is out of control in some of the emerging economies in the world. India and China in particular have terrible uh, epidemics of type 2 diabetes. The reason it's growing is that we have now access to extraordinary amounts of energy. Because for the first time in millions of years, we've created these bizarre conditions where we can be in positive energy balance whenever we want to. Until very recently, you know, humans struggled to stay in energy balance. We never got a chance to become obese because really the amount of energy we had to expend hunter-gathering just really never gave you much of an opportunity to get fat. Once we evolved agriculture, once we invented agriculture, I should say, um, we began to change. Agriculture, although it's a fair amount of work, can provide many more calories because they grow their food. Farmers easily get twice as much energy per day as a hunter-gatherer. That means twice as many offspring. So with, with the origins of agriculture, you also get an increase in population size. The population start to grow, 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 grow. The next sort of enormous transformation was the Industrial Revolution. We figured out ways to mechanize the production of food. And at the same time, we've substituted work by humans and animals with work by machines. automobiles, computers, televisions, um, automation in manufacturing. Few of us are, few, many few of us are farming. We evolved uh, as animals that move uh, to hunt, to gather, you know, to migrate. And to be physically inactive takes us away from our normal healthy state. It's only in the last 50 years with changes in industrial food production, refrigeration, packaging, that you know, the average human being can afford enough food to make themselves obese without having to spend an awful lot of energy. Today, the average American eats 100 pounds of sugar a year, right? Where our hunter-gatherer ancestors you know, struggled to get a pound or two a year. I mean, that was, that was a lot, right? Um, We've, we, but we don't have the metabolisms that are well adapted to handling 100 pounds of sugar a year. If you draw a graph on the y-axis you have diabetes presence, on the x-axis you have body weight, you will find a very strong relationship. And that the, on average, the fatter you are, the more you have diabetes. But you have to dig deeper into the biology to understand the nature of that relationship. We think about diabetes as being a disease caused by you know, the insulin pathway going awry that we become insulin resistant. In a normal, healthy individual, there's incredible tuning, like a musical instrument, like an orchestra, between the levels of glucose and nutrients in the blood and the beta cells secreting insulin. If I drink a sweet drink, the blood sugar will go up a bit and then will quickly come back down. But obesity causes insulin resistance. That's where insulin doesn't work as well as it is supposed to work. Your blood 
sugar will go up and maybe it'll go up even higher and it'll take a lot longer for that to come back down to normal. The mechanisms are not completely understood. One major thing is that happen in obesity, you have a low level chronic inflammation. The body reacts to obesity at a low level in a similar fashion to the way it reacts to an infection. And uh, in fact, obesity, you could consider it a low level inflammatory disease. And a lot of the components of an inflammatory response interfere with insulin signaling. It's also true that in obesity, the energy stored becomes greater than the adipose cells can easily handle. <clears throat> so you get what you might think of as spillover. The safest place to keep fat is your fat cell. The fat cell is a professional fat storing tissue. The, all the other tissues are affect amateurs and, and like a lot of amateurs, they screw things up when they try and handle stuff they're not designed to handle. The best analogy I can use is if it's really bad for your bathroom when your bath overflows. And let's say diabetes is the, is the wet carpet that you get. You're better off having a big bath. And the big bath is the size of your safe adipose depots. You will often see in the lower orders of British newspapers reports of these very, very obese people who had to have the fire brigade come and knock down the wall of the house to get them out of the house. They're so vastly obese. Those people almost never have diabetes. Their bath is enormous. They have almost an indefinite capacity to continue to expand their fat depot and safely store their excess energy and fat. It's only really when we start getting to the limits of our fat, uh, safe fat storage, that we start spilling over the bath. Fat has to go somewhere else other than the fat cell. And it tends to go into the heart muscle, the pancreas, the liver, the blood vessel wall, and wreak havoc. We call that ectopic deposition, deposition of energy where it should not occur. And that has been shown to also correlate with, and in some cases cause, resistance to insulin. We're today asking people to make choices that we never evolved to make. There was never selection for us to lose weight. Our bodies have all kinds of adaptations to prevent us from dieting, right? When you start dieting, you get cranky, your cortisol levels go up, um, your food cravings go up, your ability and desire to be physically active go down. This is called a famine response. People will seek out food. If you're starving, you'll do almost anything to seek out food. I mean, no one has any difficulty in understanding that they have no real control over their breathing. If I ask you to stop breathing for five minutes and I give you $10 million, you'd love to do it, but you just simply wouldn't be able to. Now, control of, of eating and drinking, it's not quite as primal and as brain stem as breathing, but hunger uh, is one of the great drivers to survival. That doesn't mean that we don't have free will, but the free will is uh, superimposed on your biological program. An overweight person going on a diet, it's just as hard for that person to go on a diet as for a, th a thin person to go on a diet. It's no different. The same famine response, the same deep adaptations are being enacted. And so when we blame people for being overweight, uh, as if it's their lack of willpower, we're essentially blaming people for being human. I find it hard to understand why you should get so upset because someone happens to carry a few kilograms of extra adipose tissue around. They're not actually impacting on your life in, in any way. I think it inhibits us think, taking it seriously uh, as, as, as a medical uh, issue. I don't think the people who take the escalator are, are lazy. They're being normal. If you put an escalator in the Kalahari Desert, hunter-gatherers there too would also take the escalator. If you put donuts and and uh, you know, soft drinks out there, of course they'd be drinking them. We just today have access to the foods that we crave, and as a result, we're getting sick. There's no analogy in the natural world for, for what we've done to ourselves. We're, we're in uncharted territory.